Hi guys, so in this Tremors sequel we are going back to perfection, but is there a double meaning in that? Is it a statement of intent that we might also be getting the masterpiece quality of the first film? I just wonder. <laughs> So this is the point of the Tremors franchise, I think, where it starts to become for the diehards. You know, I, I think Tremors 2 is a sufficiently good enough horror comedy that it could appeal to general horror fans, regardless of whether they, they want to go on and watch all seven Tremors films. Once we step over the line to number three, though, yeah, I, th I think you've really got to be into these. Not that this is a bad film, but this is the first point where we don't have Val or Earl from the first film, and I think that will put off some people. We do have Michael Gross coming back to play Burt Gummer, and I can't emphasise how important that was because he really carries this film. I mean, he's a real personality in this from, from the first minute to the last I reckon that if this series had not had Burt Gummer, it probably would have ended after three films at most. So at the start of this, Burt is returning from his latest Graboid job because that's what he does now. He's like a full-time Graboid hunter. He answers the call like a Ghostbuster and just, just goes off to wherever any Graboids have sprung up. But to his surprise, in this film... Graboids appear again in perfection, 11 years on from when the first film happened. Now, we don't just get Bert coming back in terms of returning characters. We get a whole bunch of people who were also in the original film, not the, the A-list characters from that film, it's got to be said. There's no Rhonda or Reba McIntyre, but we do get to see uh, people like, say, Mindy, uh, Nancy, Miguel and Melvin. I think I've got them all. And it's great to see these people, although they're not really elevated into the position of main principal roles in this. Most of them are still kind of in the background, just having the occasional scene. I'm, I'm particularly surprised at this when it comes to Ariana Richards as Mindy, because you'd think that she would have built up a sufficient enough profile from being in Jurassic Park to have really come into something like this, a director video horror sequel, and you know, become one of the lead characters. Maybe she would have been the surrogate granddaughter to Bert and been, been his main assistant in the film or something, but clearly they, they didn't like the actress as an adult enough to make her one of the main parts. Sometimes it happens that people who are child stars just don't go on to be quite as attractive as as adult actors. When I say attractive, I don't mean physical looks. They They just don't quite become as attractive to Hollywood bosses when they're of a certain age. Macaulay Culkin would be a prime example, Edward Furlong. And I guess that happened to Ariana Richards as well, because if you look on her filmography, she basically did one more film after Tremors 3, and, and that was it for her. She re retired from acting. So a lot of these returning characters from the original Tremors, they do come back, but they don't have all that much to do. In their stead, we get a couple of brand new characters who step into the principal roles and help Bert out for, for much of this movie. So we get a character called Jack. He's, I guess, like the Chris Pratt from Jurassic Park type person in this. At the start of this, he's running a kind of graboid adventure tour. So perfection itself has become very much a tourist hotspot since the original film. We've got a, a convenience store now which sells lots of different graboid related merchandise and Jack's got this adventure tour where he takes tourists around all the places that Graboids killed people in the first movie and he's got a buddy out in the scrub who sends up clouds of smoke to convince the tourists that there might be a new Graboid on their tail. It's all good fun. It's very, very American. You could just imagine it happening in real life. Jack, I guess, is kind of the replacement for Grady from the previous film, but he's nowhere near as annoying as Grady. I suspect that they gave the script to somebody to proofread just to make sure that there were, there were no annoying lines from Jack in this. We also get a character called Jody who runs the convenience store. I think she's meant to be a distant relation of Walter Chang from, from the first film, although it's not explicitly stated, I don't think. If she's not related to Chang, then it's a hell of a coincidence that she, she just happens to be Chinese. But, but these two, Jack and Jody, they, they are the main two new characters and they get a little bit of a romance going on eventually. And I guess most people will like these characters. You know, they're, they're just honest to goodness Americans trying to get their foot on the ladder of just starting a business. And that can be a very stressful, difficult thing to do. 
In terms of the fact that we do have lots of returning characters, though, you've, you've got to admire that about this film because if you look at other franchises, big franchises, Halloween 3, zero returning actors from the original film. Probably not the best example because that's not a Michael Myers film. Okay, Halloween 4, the third Michael Myers film, one returning actor from the, previ from the, from the original film, I think. Donald Pleasance, correct me if I'm wrong. Friday the 13th Part 3, zero returning actors from the original film, I think. Tremors 3, though, five returning actors from the original film. Regardless of whether you consider yourself a Tremors person or not, you've got to admire that. So let's talk a little bit about the actual monsters. And just with Tremors 2, we get to see yet another stage in the Graboid's life cycle. So whereas in number two, we went from Graboid to Shrieker, this time around, we go from Shrieker to Ass Blaster. And I do apologize, by the way, to referring to the Shriekers as Land Graboids in my Tremors 2 review. I just couldn't remember what they were called when I filmed that. Anyway, I don't think the Ass Blasters are as impressive as the Shriekers were in the second film. This idea of sending the monsters into the sky by having them fire gases out of their arsehole, I mean, it's, it's bordering on the silly, really. Plus, this film really didn't have the budget for this kind of thing. I mean, this film's budget is way down on what even the second film's budget was. I was impressed with the amount of practical effect shots and use of animatronics in the second film. This time around, though, there's hardly any of that. There are still puppets, but they resort to sort of sticking the heads of shriekers around the sides of doorways, and that's literally as sophisticated as it gets. There are a lot of really crappy digital effect shots in this. I mean, they are really bad. If you're going to enjoy this film, you've really just got to accept the fact that the ass blasters will not be depicted that very well on screen. If you if you can put up with that, then you might have a good time. But if you're the sort of person who just cannot tolerate bad special effects, then yeah, you might struggle with this one. Um, I am at least glad that they have one graboid not turn into a shrieker in this film. So there's this one graboid that for whatever reason, its biology is a little bit bad. It cannot make the next stage that it needs to go down, which is perfectly realistic. I mean, not every human being can have children. And I guess uh, with Graboids, it's sort of the same thing. Every now and again, there will be one of them that can't take the next step. So we have this one Graboid that's sort of like an albino one. It's, it's sort of the franchise's attempts to make a character out of one of the worms, I suppose. But they at least stop short of this particular Graboid, like refusing to attack humans because it's now their friend. You know, they don't go that far. But it's cool that in this film, the protagonists, they've got dangers above them as well as below them. And it's really funny as well how at the end of this film, they leave this Graboid alive just, just, just to foil Melvin and his property development company from their evil plans of swooping in and, and, and taking over the valley. This film obviously isn't one of the best horror sequels of all time, but it possibly is the best horror sequel I've ever seen in terms of respecting what's gone before. There are lots of Easter eggs in this and little nods to the first two films. There are references to characters who aren't even in this and the continuity it is razor sharp, honestly. And I'm, I'm somebody who really appreciates that kind of thing. I suspect a lot of people who worked on the first two Tremors films are also were working on this. I did notice that S.S. Wilson, who directed the second film, also came back um, to this film in, from, a, from a writing standpoint, regardless of what you think about the, the special effects in Tremors 3, and they are pretty bad. You've got to at least admire the love that went into writing the script. Another criticism I have is that there are these FBI characters introduced. They get at least two really notable early scenes and then they're just killed off screen. We find this information out through hearsay. It's just a little bit strange. I, I, I've got to surmise that at some point they did plan death scenes for these characters and then maybe due to a change in the production schedule because of budget reductions or something, they, they just decided not to, to, to film that. One action sequence we do see, though, is when Bert gets dragged down into the belly of a graboid and then he gets dragged like half a mile and then Jack manages to electrocute the, the worm somehow and, and rescue Bert from the ground. 
a fantastically tense, exciting sequence, probably one of the best in the franchise, although when you properly analyse that scene, you do start to notice a few problems with it. So we're asked to buy that the Graboid wouldn't immediately digest Bert. Now, something I was confused about when I was watching this the other night, and it's not the first time that I've seen this movie, but when I was watching Bert being dragged under the ground, I did wonder, does he go down just him? Or at the last second, does he manage to slip into like, an, like a hollow oil drum that's there and, and that gives him a little bit of protection when he's in the worm's belly? Maybe you can help me out in the comments with this if you can remember this scene, but it all happened so fast. Probably I should have sort of rewound the DVD and checked myself, but I was just a little bit too lazy. But even if we believe that the worm wouldn't immediately digest Bert, it, it's a bit of a stretch to think that he could function down there as a human being. I mean, most people would just faint or have a heart attack. A lot of people would just start lashing out against the side of the sack, and then that would surely make the graboid begin the digestion process a lot quicker. Oh, it's, it's, it's horrible to even think about. It, it really is. But seemingly Bert can remain calm and composed enough to lie there with his walkie-talkie coming up with a plan. I mean, it's, it's asking a lot. I mean, I know Bert is a pretty cool as a cucumber character, but even so, I still like the sequence though. I think it's, it's, it's really exciting to watch. And given how relieved I felt watching this to see Bert being pulled from the ground, I think that made me realize just how far I'd come with this character in terms of me liking him by this point of the franchise. There's also a great scene where Bert has to blow up his own house to kill a load of ass blasters and then shortly afterwards he realises that he didn't have to do that. But again, I felt quite emotional watching this house being blown up. I watched the Star Trek films quite recently and watching Bert's house getting blown up, it was the same for me as watching the Enterprise getting blown up. I mean, I was, I was kind of sat there just thinking, no, not Bert's house, not the special armoury from the first movie. Now, in terms of the finale, I don't think it's quite as clever as... Uh, what we got at the end of the first two films. They do at least stick to the same principle of characters having to hunt around for what objects they can find, that kind of thing. But the ideas they come up with this time, not as clever to me. A lot of the, the end uh, scenes take place in a scrapyard, but the way that they kill off the ass blasters sort of one by one didn't quite leave me feeling as impressed as I was at the end of one and two. But overall, still had fun with this film. I mean, it is a drop off from number two, as number two was a slight drop off from number one. But we're only talking, you know, a slight downward curve. We're not talking Nightmare on Elm Street part four going down to part five, like going off a cliff edge when you when you get to part five of, of that series. But um, no, for me, I am a I am a Tremors man through and through, so I absolutely can enjoy this film. I think it's 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 flawed, but it's still very entertaining. Time to show you the version of the film that I've got for this. I've got a DVD copy of Tremors Three. It's part of this Tremors triple pack. This is significant actually because Tremors Three is the only one that I don't own on Blu-ray. So Tremors 1, I've got a separate copy, which is a 4K. Tremors 2, I've got a separate copy, which is a Blu-ray. I don't have a separate copy for Tremors 3 yet, which is why I had to go back to this really old school DVD copy. For 4, 5, 6 and 7, I've got Blu-rays for all of them. Go away, flies. Um, the picture quality for Tremors 3 on DVD is all right. But when I say that, I mean, it's, it's really early noughties, you know, it's not been properly remastered. It's it's perfectly watchable. It's just not up there with what you would get on a more modern Blu-ray. At some point, I would like to get a Blu-ray for Tremors 3 and complete my collection. It's, it's just not something I've done yet. And I'll also add that there's no there's no features on this particular version. I, I would be absolutely fascinated to watch some features connected to uh, Tremors 3, but uh, sadly not on this. Right, let's get to the Bag of Terror and find out what sort of score I'm going to give Tremors 3 back to perfection. One. Two. Three bloody axes out of five. So we started out with five axes for Tremors 1, then we moved down to four axes for Tremors 2. Now we have three axes for Tremors 3. Does this mean that for Tremors 4, the prequel, we will get two axes? I certainly hope not. Until next time, cheerio, and I'll leave you with a word of advice. 
when you're walking through the desert, always keep an eye on your feet.